last time I went to the sperm bank. Hey, welcome to Sunday's edition of Collider Mailbag. Thank you for joining us here on this lovely weekend day. My name is simply Mark Ellis, but my God, the panel that I have painstakingly assembled here for you guys today, <laughs> unlike any other that you will ever see on the internet, on TV, maybe even in the world of cinema, joining me is Sinead DeFries. Hey guys, be very, very grateful that you just missed that conversation, okay? Because it was pretty intense. <laughs> and Mark Riley. Yeah, that was a good weekend, though, wasn't it, Alice? Oh, dude, yeah. <laughs> it really was. Hey, best 60 bucks I ever made. Um, <laughs> so this yeah. is the show where you guys write in all week long. Sometimes we answer questions <coughs> in our mailbag segment on Movie Talk, and then we also have this mailbag show, which is entirely run by you guys. Anytime, y'all can email us, collidervideo at gmail.com, and hopefully your question is awesome enough to be read on the air and out of the mouth of the one, the only miss, Sinead DeFreeze. So, Sinead... What's our first question today? Lincoln writes, hey guys, big fan of the show. I'm on the road a lot and it's very entertaining. And my question is, who is your favorite male and female protagonist? Mine are Indiana Jones and Ellen Ripley. Love this question, it's a great kickoff. Thank you, Lincoln, as somebody on the road myself, I enjoy watching my shows too. I am gonna set the rules that we each only get one. You get one female oh, and oh. you get one male and to make it even more enticing, no Star Wars. You're oh, not allowed to damn. go to Star Wars. Because I would go to Star Wars, too. I would say either Luke Skywalker or R2-D2, who I consider a male. Uh -huh. And then I would go uh, Princess Leia. Or maybe I'd go Rey Palpatine. So I can't mm. go with Star Wars. Then I'm going to go with my boy Marty McFly, Michael J. Fox from Back to the Future. It's my favorite protagonist male category. And my favorite protagonist female category is Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. You know what, she's got the voice of a bird, but she also has uh, the brain, she's got the heart, she's got everything you need to make it to Oz and back safely. Riley, male, I, female. I, you took mine. I can't do Star Wars, I was gonna do Luke Skywalker. <laughs> See how I worked it in there anyways? I totally worked it in there anyways, now you know. <laughs> we, okay, we I'll play, minute meeting about I will this. play by your rules. And I will say Henry Thomas and E.T. Ah, Elliot okay. and E.T. His journey is amazing. He finds his best friend, happens to be a, a foreigner. Uh, and they, uh, they a have foreigner. A, a foreigner. He's an alien from another planet. That's right, a foreigner. Yeah. So he, <laughs> so why not? So, uh, well, he's not from Canada. Henry you know? Thomas. <laughs> And now I wish I could change my answer because another <laughs> one came to my head finally. Okay, so for my female protagonist, I'm going to go old school. Elizabeth Shue in Adventures in ah, Babysitting. Damn. Hell yes. See that movie. Ah, it's so much good better one. than Dorothy. Good damn one. It. Who it's is a your good other one. male protagonist? Who's your runner-up? Uh, I was going to go uh, Roy Scheider, Chief Brody in Jaws. Very, very nice. Yeah, I, yeah. You could have gone Bruce the Shark from a certain point of view. Yeah. Uh, Sinead, I know you can do a bunch of these. Just, just give me one. All right, well, let's change it up. Before. I'll do um, animated. Yeah, okay. I like it. So, uh, protagonist male, I'll go uh, Russell from Up. Oh, <laughs> He's my favorite forever and ever. That's, that's a kid, right? That's a kid. He's the kid, yeah. 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 Um, and for female, I will go... Mm, I will go... Oh, man, it's so hard. I mean, Belle is up there you know, for me. She, she would be... <sighs> I'm not a big Ariel guy. See, I'm going to go for... Female, I'm gonna go Ariel number one. That there you was go. A close second. <sighs> yeah, that's a good one. Went with a fish number one. All right, fine. <laughs> Thank you for your question, Lincoln. We're off and running on mailbag. What's up next? Vladimir writes, hello, my favorite YouTube show. So recently, two large stories in movie news were about method acting, Ari e. Jared Leto, and the realistic circumstances of the scenes Leonardo DiCaprio was in. And after The Revenant, I don't want to hear about this stuff anymore. I understand that shooting. Uh, I understand that shooting process does not differ much from movie to movie, and marketing needs a hook that can be a catchy soundbite that will remind viewers about the movie. But in the case of Leto's story, method acting is not about being in a role between takes. Immersion into a character is merely one of the techniques used for rehearsals and role research. Most method actor practitioners are capable to capable to act without resorting to torturing colleagues with pranks hmm. and horrible presence because the character would do it. Frequent references of stuff like this and the misconception that it creates about actors' abilities irritates me. So I wanted to ask, do you have pet peeves related with movie promotion? And what are mis some misconceptions you see that are routinely pushed in movie coverage? Thank you. Keep bringing on the filthy. That, that's a long and good question. I like it a lot. It makes me think of the story that they kept talking about 
from The Revenant, which was Tom Hardy got in a fist fight with his director, probably because he was being pushed to that limit out there in the middle of the wilderness. And they kept talking about that. Same with Jared Leto. It was bugging the heck out of me. I'm like, I get it. He's method. He's sending rats in a box to people with used condoms. Fine. You're a method <laughs> actor. Wonderful. Move on. Go act. I, no. I don't like it, too. It, it, it takes away from the actual movie. It goes to my, what I say always, is just if you want to see a movie, go see a movie. And these movie studios, they always kind of jump on these big stories that could work for or against it. I think of World War Z, where they were always talking about at least before everybody's talking about, oh the reshoots they're reshooting the entire movie it's gonna suck it's gonna suck then it comes out it's critically well received makes a lot of money and then all of a sudden it's promoted as see even though the reshoots were see you could still get it and it was just monopolized the conversation um so that that was my big one that i i thought of immediately ellis what about you i, I agree with vladimir that it does get a little nauseating sometimes when you hear about oh this actor was so method they stayed in character never got out of character well bravo there's other actors that were in the same movie that didn't have to resort to that and they're just as good in the film yeah i understand when double d lewis is you know, oh he, he was abraham lincoln I'm like, well, that's really impressive. I'm pretty sure Daniel Day-Lewis is a good enough actor to just roll out of bed on set, put on a beard, and become Abraham Lincoln. So I do get a little sick of hearing about how they stayed in character for three months. Just sounds creepy to me, you know? <laughs> yeah. It really, even when Jim Carrey was playing Andy Warhol and he never got out of character for mm -hmm. Man on the Moon, as, as much as I love Jim Carrey and as, as impressed as I am with the artistic ability of these people to be able to do that, it just, it's like, really? Do you have to do it? And that's how I felt watching Jared Leto as the Joker. Because if I didn't know that story going into it, that wasn't one of the things that the marketing material put out, that he was Joker the whole time on set, I might have enjoyed his performance even more. Yeah. Because you hear about all these things, and he's not in the movie that much. And sure, there's probably a lot of scenes left on the cutting room floor, but it's like, you had to do that for that? Yeah. And, and everybody's like, well, he's setting up a character for a future movie. Then maybe he can be Joker in the future movie when he actually gets to be in the movie more. Yeah. So it, it does start to bug me after a while. That's my biggest uh, issue with the marketing of a movie. The one thing that I do enjoy that I know it, it upsets a lot of other people is when they're marketing a horror movie. And the cast and crew start talking about strange things that happen on the set of it. Like, you always hear those stories about The Exorcist, like yeah. all these crazy things happening on set. And you heard about it with the first and maybe even the second Conjuring, is that they oh. built the set, but because of the things that were brought to the set, maybe some bad spirits came along in there and made some people feel a little weirded out in certain rooms. I do like hearing those stories because it makes me feel like the horror movie is more real. Yeah, and it makes me think too of like Jaws and all the back and forth about how the shark didn't work, but that to me is just a, a sign of how cool it is, film history, that that movie came out the way it did. And that was way after the internet and way after, or way before the internet, all this stuff. So it just adds the film history that I like. Right, and if you're an actor or an actress and that's your problem, process is like I just need to be in this character for the entire length of shooting then that's fine uh, the best of luck to you I just think that sometimes we overrate that a little bit because how about the people who don't have to do that and can still show up and be damn good in a movie yeah. and then just go home and actually be a normal human being the rest of the time <laughs> that's more impressive to me anyway yeah little known fact Jared Leto has shown up on set of Blade Runner 2 as the Joker it's weird <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's still he's, he hasn't fallen out of character I'm I'm not serious oh, I was like what <laughs> It's like a cop can you that goes too deep him? undercover. You know, it's, it's, it's like, oh man, I had to bust his heroin ring, and now five years later, yeah. I'm addicted to heroin. Like, yeah. Make sure if you get into a character, you can get back out. <laughs> Leave a trail of breadcrumbs before you become a character, so you can get back out of the woods. Okay. Exactly. All right, Shanae, what's our next question? Austin writes, "Hey, Glider Crew, I've been watching you daily for months now, and have to thank you all for providing trustworthy entertainment news in a great way and making me smile and laugh every day." My question today is related to beginning filmmaking. What advice would you provide for someone who is trying to develop an animated film but has no experience other than film school? What tips could you give me or others trying to develop stories for the big or small screen in order to protect our ideas, whether it be animated or live action? Watching you all daily has inspired me to keep trying to develop a career in film, and I trust your ideas and opinions. Thank you very much, and may the force be with you. Okay, my advice is going to sound simplistic and dumb, and maybe it is, but uh, draw. 
Like, like, no, seriously, you don't have to be a gifted animator to just get a character design that you want, because once you have the character design in place somewhat, then A, it can help you write the story a little bit better because you know how these characters look, and you can also take that to an animation company or to your friend down the street who may know a little bit more about how to animate, or you can download a lot of apps right now that they have available. That There's a lot of software that can help budding animators or animated films get off the ground, okay? So there is a lot of legwork you can put in before you need to make it the finished glossy product that's going to be done by professionals. Uh, but my other piece of advice to you is get yourself a Mark Riley because Mark Riley <laughs> knows a lot more about animation than I do. So what's your take, Riley? Yeah, I'm I'm I, I'm work for hire. Uh, I charge uh, one thousand dollars an hour. No I'm kidding. Um, this is a great question, and you know to to start with the animated. Uh, first, I would work on the script and your story. And once you lock that in, there is a number of people out there, animators, uh, directors, producers, that want to also be where you're at. So they might spark to your idea and want to work, not necessarily for free, but they will get on board because it's something special. Always start with the story. That's across the board that I always say. I made a short film, Animated, and I went on Craigslist and found animators. I posted a, a job description. I said, this is what it is. And then I did have to weed out some of the, the weirdos that were you know, also selling a couch. But <laughs> I finally found some really great guys. And we worked for six months together. It was a very low budget. They loved the idea. I loved their animation. We worked together. And I found these guys because they're like us. They want to, they're out there. Animators that just animate are doing, they wanna do what you're doing. They wanna make a big break as well. So they're gonna be more than likely willing to wanna help, like I said, be it for free or be it for a very reduced rate to get that experience. You hit up these really talented people coming out of college or have been in the industry for maybe a couple of years. I did the same thing. I made a comic book. I got a fresh faced girl right out of college. She was insanely talented, loved our idea. We all worked together and we made something special and we still, have it and it's still out there so that would be my advice as far as protecting your ideas always register your idea at uh wga and just for you know copyright it as well the mi big misconception i always say is studios are not going to go steal your idea they don't want a lawsuit they're not going to lift it completely there might be similar ideas but at the end of the day they're not going to take unsolicited submissions because they they don't want to get you know uh, uh accused of stealing ideas so to protect your idea, just register at WGA and copyright it, and you're safe. What's it Trust cost me. to get a to get a registered at WGA? Twenty like, bucks. Twenty bucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure the process is out there online. So yeah, it's the it's bottom very line. easy. All online now. You go to WGA.com or .org, and they have a, a a nice button right there, and it it just happens in a, in a flash. It's five minutes, and it's right there. And uh, just remember, when you're on Craigslist, Craigslist is just like the internet overall, where, yes, there's a lot of dark, scary corners around there, but you can also find somebody that has some sort of talent or maybe a couch. Yeah. Or a yeah. pot. Don't yeah. buy drugs. <laughs> don't buy drugs. Online. No. Don't or buy. ever, kids. That's bad. Sinead, That's bad. What's up next? <laughs> Leland writes, hi, Collider team. I've been watching you since the AMC days and look forward to all of your shows. The other day, Perry mentioned twice something about titles, and I was wondering whether you loved the movie or hated it. What are some of your favorite movie titles? Thanks for your love for movies, Leland. You know, the, there's a movie that, that I, I'm not the biggest fan of, but I love the title so much, and it's A Clockwork Orange. I think it's just one of the coolest sounding titles. It's so intriguing. doesn't give away anything about what the movie's about. Uh -huh. You walk in there, and you're like, I don't know. Is it about fruit? Is it about clocks? It's No, it, it's, it's a crazy, crazy talented filmmaker making a film that he was clearly passionate about. And Stanley Kubrick has a lot of neat movie titles, but I think A Clockwork Orange takes the cake. As far as the worst title of all time, there's bad titles out there, and then there's bad sequels to movies that already had stupid titles. So I think the breadwinner for the worst title in history, I'm going to set the bar very high, Mark Riley. Okay. Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo. <laughs> He went to Europe and that became was a, a European horrible gigolo. Horrible movie, and I actually liked Male Gigolo. Male Gigolo wasn't the it, well. It obviously it wasn't, wasn't fantastic, but I laughed. Vichy, vichy, vichy. It's like there's a lot of good scenes in that movie. Okay, can you think of a worse title than <laughs> Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo? Hmm, a worse title? Yeah. You know what's a really polarizing title is hmm. "Dude, Where's My Car?" Yeah, I was I just think it's get, a yeah. great title. I think it's a great title for what yeah. that movie is. Some people exactly. hate it. Exactly. Yeah. What do you got, Riles? I would go with uh, John Carter is an 
awful title yeah because it's based on source material a princess of mars and then a warlord of mars doesn't that sound better who the hell is john carter if you are outside and you don't know the source material you're basically telling us that some dude named john carter has a movie about him that could be anything is he an insurance salesman what is this (laughs) john carter here uh i will do your accounting for twenty dollars an hour no this is an epic movie set on mars and they named it john carter why do you think it bombed Nobody knew what it was. If you didn't know that source material, you need to change your title and put a warlord of Mars or a princess of Mars. That's a a princess of Mars. I know what your movie's about. (laughs) Takes place on Mars. There's a princess. And then when you get in there, oh, John Carter is on Mars. Great. Got it. That's just the worst title for me. Uh, Best title. I still love Jaws. Jaws is. Ooh, that's good. It just it it just tells you so much without telling you a thing. I mean, Jaws can mean anything. Is it about a dentist? We don't know. No, it's about a killer shark. And I remember the story of Steven Spielberg sitting in the office at Universal and and you know going through the galley of the pages, and they were trying to figure out a title. They were calling it Great White Death, Great White, all these different things. I can't remember how they decided on Jaws. But the rest is history. Yeah, Great White just, it's it, it, fine rock, man. It just not, it, it doesn't grab you like Jaws does. Jaws yeah. just, that title grabs you and does not let go. Yeah. Production team, did we have a Clockwork Orange up there already, or did you find that after I gave the answer? Damn it. All right. Wow. I didn't steal it from there. So now i got to give a different one. But I actually no, found a better one that I like even better than Clockwork Orange is Rebel Without a Cause. I think it just perfectly yep. is – it's a great summation. That, that's what a title should be, a summation of the movie without giving away too many plot points. But Rebel Without a Cause, it's not only, uh, you know, the, the title of a film, but it also – gave an identity to James Dean that he still has to this day, yeah. uh, posthumously, of course. But I think Rebel Without a Cause is a great one. Uh, Sinead, do you have any movie titles uh, that you love or hate? Uh, yeah, I have The Perks of Being a Wallflower. I really mm, like that one. That's a good one. There Will Be Blood. <clears throat> great um, one. The Devil's Advocate, only because I always say that saying. Mm. And Just Go With It, which is that Adam Sandler movie. But I love that title for Oh, time. man, you had me until just go with yeah. it. Just go with it. Because it's such a thing, like, just go with it. And the did, whole movie has to do with the title. Like, they say it throughout the movie. See, I, like I looked that. at that title as, like, we got Adam Sandler. We got Jennifer. Just, just go, go see with the movie. Just go with it. That's, such a, that's, like a, that's a good thing to live by. Just I, go with it. I think I'm just Can thinking about Can I give you the... a worse title than... Um, <laughs> Uh, Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo. What do you got? Yeah. The Englishman Who Went Up a Hill But Came Down a Mountain. Yeah. Hugh Grant, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah Hugh it's Grant. It's not a great title. It's not a great title. It's, it's a pretty not, good movie. Like a, it doesn't seem like a title at all. It's, no, a, very, it's, it's a very thematic, yeah. little deep title that's like, we're making some art here. He goes up <laughs> on the hill and then comes down a man from a mountain. We get it. Yes. I, I was like, man, that's a long... I remember going to the theater and going, yes, two for... The Englishman that went up a hill and then ticket clear. I was like, <laughs> wrap it up. You took it back. Yeah, yeah. I get it. You know what they should have called it? They should have called it the Englishman who went up a hill. Just go with <laughs> it. It's an English guy. He's climbing stuff. Just Do go really with it. You really don't like just go with it? I feel like it's a good thing to live by. I think it's the movie itself it. that left a bad it's, taste in my mouth. It's no fifty first dates. Which has a not cameo much is. by Rob Schneider. Uh-huh. Yeah. The European Jiggle. <laughs> What's our next question? All right. Sam writes, Hello, Collider Crew. You guys are my daily addiction. One of the most divisive things about Suicide Squad was the usage of the songs throughout the movie. Some people liked, others, such as much, hated it. So my question is, what is the best or worst use of music in a movie? A best for me would be Time in a Bottle in X-Men Days of Future Past, and a worst would be Gone, Gone, Gone in The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Thanks, and may the force be with you. Ah, I like this question a lot. Um, that Time in a Bottle in X-Men Days of Future Past is so brilliant Mm -hmm. that the usage Mm -hmm. what a great call man i just keep that that when now when you have that song play i think of that scene so um best use of songs i loved um uh this uh what fight club that's what i was trying to get to fight club had a great use of like some random songs in there with a great score on top of that um and then i everybody says it but it was so effective guardians of the galaxy Mm -hmm. every time the Guardians of the Galaxy, that whole marketing campaign was based around how great the songs were and then how different the the movie was and how great it looked. Um, and it, and I, I just, because it's right there in front of me, yeah, Suicide Squad, my biggest complaint was the music. It was so, it was just these chunks that were like 
10 seconds, and then we were on to another song and another song, and they couldn't have been more different, so I kept being ripped out of the tone, so that was a big issue for me. Yeah, it is interesting. It's such a fine line to walk between, because I actually really like the music in Suicide Squad, but it's like, how, how do you balance yourself between trying to use music to tell the story of a character, but not being overly reliant on music mm -hmm. in place of an actual story. I thought a film that really walked that line well was Days and Confused because the oh, story yeah. moves you from one, it's a great soundtrack That's anyway. Great. That was like on the other day. Tunes, but it's like, it moves you from one scene to the next so efficiently and it gives you the different vibe of what we're about to get to so you know the one scene when they're driving they stole the statues they paint them up like kiss and you hear rock and roll all night it's like that's that's what that scene is going to be about and then later when the party at the moon tower they're starting to run out of beer they're tapping a keg and they play tuesday's gone you're thinking oh man this is just this is now this great night this great experience that we just had it's almost about to end and then when the kid puts on slow ride to win the headphones, which I'm not a huge fan of that song. I'm so, I never needed to hear that song again in my life, unless it's in Days Confused, because I just think that it was so well used. And Wayne's World, I'll give a shout out to. I, I think Wayne's World really utilizes music very, very well. Yeah, and I have to, I have to throw in Almost Famous as well. That Almost mm -hmm. Famous is what a masterful use of of music. Because I remember them playing um, Cat Stevens' "The Wind" at a certain point, right, right when. He was at his low point and it like it literally brought tears to my eyes because it was so powerful at that moment for the character. They played that, which is such a beautiful song. And I was like, oh, my God, it was great. <laughs> so I have to say that for worst, it's you know, it's something that, that I hate to admit because I love this movie so much. But sometimes it, a movie becomes clear product placement for either a, you know, like a soda brand or an artist that they have no reason to be in the movie and one of the best scenes to illustrate that point is in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 The Secret of the Ooze when they're uh -oh. fighting and they pop into a club and it just happens to be occupied by a oh. bunch of people watching Vanilla Ice on stage That's right. and he's doing the ninja rap and I like ninja ninja rap it's great but it's like, it, why is that in the movie at all? As a little kid watching, it didn't take me out of the movie because, you know, I'm, I'm a dope and I'm just thinking about how awesome a slice of pizza would be. But <laughs> it's just not supposed to be there at all. Yeah. Uh, Sinead, your favorite, least favorite use of music in cinema. I can't, I honestly can't think of a least favorite, but um, I love Guardians of the Galaxy and um, the 21 pilot song in Suicide Squad is everything. Uh, <laughs> I loved it. Um, I will say the song in Tron Legacy when he's in the arcade and he turns on the machine and I want to say it's Journey sweet. Separate Ways. Yes, but then there's an that's the first nice one. Pull. But then there's another song in the arcade and I'm almost sure it's Sweet Dreams Are Made of This and the combination oh, of those yeah. two songs in that one scene which is supposed to be like one of the best scenes of the whole movie is I think one of the two what two greatest uses of music in a film. Plus, nice. I just love that whole soundtrack to Ta Tron Legacy because it's Daft Punk and it's, yeah. the whole movie's great. But Journey into Eurythmics yep. is just dope. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that Sweet Dream song is cool. I prefer the Marilyn Manson version myself. And either way, it's, it's a good song to use in that movie. Yeah. That song gets a little overused in trailers, though. Sweet I, Dreams? I, yeah, it's like every other. It, it, All right, it's, fine. Uh, okay, we, we <laughs> What's our next question? Shit all over my... No, it was a good, it was a good pull. All I'm right, really Jonathan Rios writes... Just kidding. <laughs> hey, Collider team. A few weeks ago, I saw the trailer to the trailer of Arrival, and I was completely sold. Since then, they've released two full trailers, but I've been avoiding them like the plague. I want to go into the Arrival knowing the bare minimum. I love the cast, the crew, and premise, and don't need anything else to sell me. I'm sure it's hard in your line of work, but have any of you ever avoided a marketing campaign out of fear of having the movie spoiled? Keep up the great job. Watch the show every single day. I totally understand the sentiment, Jonathan. I, I tend to not do it. Be, a, because you, we usually we're talking about trailers and stuff that drop, so I, I can't because I want to give you guys my honest opinion. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the point when they're showing, like, here's an exclusive clip, I don't like watching those. I yeah. would rather avoid those. And I remember one for a movie that turned out to be not so good, Independence Day Resurgence. Mm -hmm. they, they, they had these trailers, and I was already sold on Independence Day Resurgence. And I'm like, yeah, this looks good. Then they, the, like a five-minute trailer came out. And we had, it was one of the topics on Movie Talk, and I'm like, I, I didn't watch it. I don't want to watch it. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sick of seeing 
you know, material for this movie. You already have my money. Stop putting this stuff out. I'm just going to go see the movie. So I kind of put the blinders up for that one. Riley, can you think of a movie that's come out that you avoided the marketing materials for because you just did not want to know anything about it? Oh, yeah, The Force Awakens. I, I, I saw the that last trailer that they... Uh, the Monday Night Football the one? The Monday Night Football one. And I made a call that that was it. I'm not going to watch anymore. I'm already sold. That was already too much for me as is because I was so mm -hmm. into it. I was working at Geek Nation at the time as their managing editor, and I had a staff, and I literally said, any Star Wars stuff that comes your way, <laughs> you are covering it. I made that executive decision, and I avoided all the TV spots, all the Entertainment Weekly uh, spreads, the Empire spreads, the other TV spots, because they showed everything. Because I then out of curiosity went back after I saw the movie and went they've ruined this movie they showed everything mm -hmm. they, they showed ruin the, the movie well they had marketing campaign showed you everything I mean they did they showed you everything they showed you the last duel they showed the setup for the last duel they showed this last space battle over Starkiller base so well, that happens a lot but, but you don't know watching the trailer if you clearly yeah, know of watching not. the trailer of course like, not. when they showed that chase in Vegas uh, for Jason Bourne in the trailer mm -hmm. I, we were all like yeah it probably is going to be the climax of the scene yeah but Star Wars I mean it's like like we were starting to piece together that there might be a battle in the snow somewhere that takes place later on in the film. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, though. Oh, yeah, no. And I knew. I mean, I, f I could place it even with that Monday Night Football trailer. I just started avoiding it because I wanted it. I just wanted to be excited. I just really wanted to just go in as blind as possible, which is almost impossible to do nowadays, especially for these big budget movies. I did the same thing for Avengers Age of Ultron. That leaked trailer came out mm -hmm. before they actually released the trailer, and I avoided both. I was like, I don't want to see anything more. Same deal. I was like, nah, I'm just going to avoid it. Sinead, do you enjoy watching trailers, or do you try to avoid marketing for a movie as much as you can? I mean, I like trailers, but I agree that I have yet to... It's been a while since I've... I felt like a trailer hasn't spoiled a movie for me. Yeah. And the worst is also like when they put out a trailer and then you see stuff that doesn't even end up in the movie. Yeah, it bums me out. It bums me out. I'm like, I watched your trailer. The least you could have done was add, included this in your movie. They did movie. that with Jason Bourne a couple times. It's, it's You haven't seen upsetting. the movie yet. There's a very cool scene in the trailer and it's just not that shot in the movie. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. If it's, if it's a franchise I'm extremely familiar with, um, I will avoid it. Like uh, once I saw Spider-Man in the Civil War trailer, I was really bummed. While everyone was celebrating, I was really bummed. I did not yeah. want to know that he was going to be in Civil War. I did not want to know. And so after that, I stopped watching all trailers, didn't rewatch any of the trailers I'd already seen with hopes that it wasn't going to trigger more uh, exposure to the films. Because after that, I was like, I, and even after the scene movie, after seeing the movie, I was like, man, that would have been so much cooler if I had no idea Spider Man was in the movie. Yeah. Sometimes I'll forgive it. Like, I'd be like, oh, yeah, the movie is so cool. Force Awakens, still cool. Wasn't right. that upset about it. But Civil War, I was genuinely upset after the movie. It might wow. help, it might not, but the way I, I try to look at trailers, because I love watching trailers, is I look at them as just little two minute pieces of art. Where right. if you just watch that Civil War trailer as like, and then we got this fun thing at the end. But how do you not get your brain to start like putting it all together in your head? Because that's mm -hmm. exactly what I do after every trailer. My brain doesn't function on that level. <laughs> It's a very, it's a very <laughs> basic pyramid needs of survival, my brand. Yeah, that's actually really smart, though. Just, yeah. just try to take it for what it is and not think. I'm just happy I clicked the button right. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. All right, what's our next question? Raymond writes, hey, Glider Crew, big fan from the Philippines. Been watching um, since your AMC days. I was like, am I saying the same thing? <laughs> been watching since your AMC days. I've been watching your movie reviews recently and noticed that everyone seems to have different takes on everything. I know it could be on taste or preference in movies. My question is, is it possible that your review can be affected by the experience you have in the theater while watching the movie? For example, loud cheering from the audience, awkward silence at a joke, or can the audience affect your movie judgment? Thanks if you consider my question on the show and more power. Yeah, uh, this is a good question. And Batman v Superman, for me, that uh, audience uh, experience for me made that movie a lot of fun for me. And maybe it's carried with me ever since because mm -hmm. I liked Batman v Superman, Donna Justice a lot. And I let that movie get spoiled for me every way till Sunday because I didn't get to see it with you guys at the press screening. Then I had to do the show notes for the spoiler review and I was like, meh. Whatever, here we go. <laughs> and I let all the negative, uh, negative reviews come in, the, the people that kind of liked it, the people that loved it, everything. 
colored my opinion. And I was just like, man, this sucks. Oh, well. And so then I went opening night and this guy came in dressed as Batman, walked in to thunderous applause. <laughs> he throws his arms up. He walks in and he takes a seat and everybody's just going, I wore my Superman shirt and my jacket that I wear in the schmo down. And people are like, yeah, you know, pointing at me. And then the movie starts and people were cheering and they had, at least in my theater, they had a hell of a time. And me and my girlfriend, Julie, sat there and we were like, this is, this is fun, man. Yeah, all right, super, yeah. And we left going, this is great. What a great time. So I come out and I go, yeah, I, I really like the movie. And people are like, really? <laughs> and maybe it's because the audience experience was so much fun that I just was just pulled in with it. So that was my experience. I would love to be sitting next to Batman watching Batman be Superman because you know this is his only reaction. It's just like... <laughs> He's like, that's good. Yeah, and that's then good. he probably just gets up to pee when it's like not his scene. When it's like Superman dealing with Lex Luthor, he's like, oh, I gotta go drink. This and I'll be back when when I'm back on screen. Um, I, I I try not to let the audience affect my actual judgment of a movie, but it can certainly determine how good of a time you have in the theater. My my most you know utilized example of this would be comedies because mm. comedies, if the audience ain't laughing, you are not going to be laughing audibly as much. You're, it's just not going to happen. But if the audience is roaring with you, you're going to laugh more. There's a movie that came out called Let's Be Cops that people uh -huh. just don't think is that funny. <laughs> I found it hilarious. And I was sitting there with Josh McCuga. Yeah. We were watching in the screening. And just for whatever reason, that audience was all on board with this movie. We were laughing a lot. And then you see these scathing reviews of how bad it was. I was like, I enjoyed that movie. So maybe the audience caught up my judgment a little bit. I like to think that I'm, that I'm better than having them tell me how I feel about a movie, but it is a great feeling to be in a house with everybody laughing at the same time. Sinead, can your opinion of a film get tainted or improved by the audience you're watching it with? Yeah, and um, it makes me think of the time that I saw Get Him to the Greek in theaters. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the audience laughed like it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen in their entire lives from beginning to end. And it I will never forget how much fun I had at that movie. And then after I came home, a lot of people were like, yeah, it's okay. Like, it was funny. I laughed a couple times. <laughs> I happen to think that that movie is hysterical, and I think it is because of my experience in the theater. I've never seen a movie ever and had that much laughter or surrounding me the entire movie i'll put let's be cops up against get him to the greek any day of the week what say you in the comment section <laughs> uh do we have one more question yes charleston writes hello collider crew how's it going you've probably heard the theory of the infinity stone spelling out thanos's name for example tesseract is the t <laughs> ether is the a Orb O Scepter S. Do you think that Hela from Thor Ragnarok is Infinity Stone herself? And do you think that Doctor Strange's necklace for N will be an Infinity Stone also? Thanks for reading my question. That's that's a good one. Damn, Gina. Um, I I don't know. I, I am out of my depth here. I am happy to say that I I am not sure how to answer that question. So what I will say is that it's a great theory. I have no idea if it's true or not. I have no idea if it's steeped in the comic book mythology. What I can tell you is that I think that if I had to only guess one of those things becoming true, mm -hmm. like if Hela is Infinity Stone or if Doctor Strange's necklace is an Infinity Stone, it would be pretty cool to have him when he pops into Infinity War walk up to something and just reveal that that is the Infinity Stone. Mm. So I would be leaning towards Doctor Strange definitely being one if I had to pick somebody from there. But then with we need an H, so maybe it's Hella. Riley, what say you? Yeah, I'm with you. I think I actually know a lot about this theory and love it so much mm. and actually believe it to be true. Whoa. Wait, what I, do you mean you know a lot? Like you know, uh, yeah, you know? I, 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 yeah, I've I've seen the, uh -huh. the, the comments. I've yeah, seen yeah, yeah. the fans talking about it. I've looked into it myself. There's a cool article out there. I can't remember the website that mm. breaks this down and then gives, they actually haven't used uh, Hela as a as an infinity stone, but definitely Doctor Strange's necklace. So they're trying to pinpoint where the next two will come from. So I'm, I'm geeky like that. I love mm -hmm. it. So, Doctor Strange, I think, will have a necklace that is an, an Infinity Stone. Then I always, and this is what I like to do, it's like a puzzle. Then I go to, well, James Gunn said there's no Infinity Stones in Guardians of the Galaxy, mm -hmm. Volume 2. Okay, so we'll rule that out. Yeah, if I take he him, tells some fibs, he take, yeah. he, he might tell some fibs, because that would be the most logical place. Right. The other one would be Thor. So I don't think a person can be, this. this is phrased like, Hela is an Infinity Stone. Now maybe there's, maybe she grabs one in 
the vault that the destroyer is guarding in Thor on Asgard, because I know they have the Tesseract up there now. Who knows what other goodies they have in there? Um, so I think it's a great theory. I think calling Hela is a good, it's a good direction to go in. I think we might get another Infinity Stone in Thor Ragnarok and in Doctor Strange. I think that's where they'll come if we take James Gunn's word. Now, if he's totally bold-faced lying, I would say <laughs> you're going to find one in Guardians Volume 2. That's Either cool. way, searching after these damn Infinity Stones. Don't you feel a little bit like Indiana Jones? Or doesn't yeah. it kind of remind you of like the Harry Potter franchise? Harry yes. Potter was was the key in the end. Exactly. Remember? That's that's a great call. Yeah, he was the last Horcrux. Yes. He and that's when Voldemort. Oh, spoiler! I can't. I'm not going there. Whatever. Can it's I? been like 12 years, okay. isn't it? Yeah. When. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. You got the thing up there. I I totally forgot. Oh that my god! Harry Look at the spoiler. The last. Harry was the last Horcrux. That was the whole key to the whole thing. Remember, they couldn't find the seventh one. Was yeah, there seven? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I believe so. He ended seven. up being the one. So. Yeah. However you pronounce her name, Hela, Hela, Hela. Hela. She Hela. could be it. Man, what one of the biggest mistakes in movie history is that adopted parent couple making Harry live under the stairs. Like yeah. that dude is a magical wizard. He's worth a billion dollars. He's a horcrux. Like, uh huh. He's a give horcrux. the kid a room. Yeah, give him a bed. Yeah, he deserves it. He's a wizard. Damn it. <laughs> all right, that's all the time we have here on movie talk. It's not movie talk. It's collider mailbag. Aww. Whatever. Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. I want to thank everybody both behind the camera and up front here with me. Joining me today on the panel, Mr. Infinity Stone himself, Mark <laughs> Riley. Where can the kids find you, sir? You can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, here on Sundays for mailbag. Tuesdays is collider nightmares. Thursdays the Schmo's No Main Show. And, you know, nobody loved when Hermione got together with Ron Weasley mm -hmm. more than Sinead because it left Harry wide open to make <laughs> Sinead Mrs. Potter. Where can everybody find you online? Yeah, well, he ended up taken also, let's be real, by the other Weasley. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, did that happen too? Yeah, Ginny. Yeah. I, I watch think you need to rewatch the Harry Potter you've read, Fantastic Beasts and where to find but them. I'll Ellis, be steeped in that war. You've read the books, though, Ellis, so I know you know. Oh, I love the books. They're sitting on my toilet right now. Great stuff. <laughs> Um, anyways, you can find me here on Mondays hosting Collider TV Talk, on Fridays hosting Collider Movie Talk, and hosting Mailbag over the weekend. I am Simply Mark Ellis. Thank you to all the fans that came out to see me at the Comedy Store last night. You guys can tickets for all my upcoming stand-up shows at MarkEllisLive.com. Check out Christian and I's channel, Schmoes No, on YouTube, and of course, subscribe right here at Collider Video. And don't forget, keep sending in those mailbag questions. Maybe they get read here or on Collider Movie Talk, collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll see you guys tomorrow for a very special episode of Movie Talk where we got a big announcement coming up. Stay tuned. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.